guest speaker. And I now call Mr. Jeremy Rick. I don't know how you do it because you live and you lead so many different lives. Jeremy is an economist, a theorist, an author of uh, two dozen books, an activist, and also a remarkable thinker. And um, those of you in the room, your uh, business leaders, senior managers, human resources directors, and you have, of course, a lot of uh, business performance challenges. And I'm sure that, Jeremy, in a way or another, you have brought ideas, concepts, explanations, maybe even solutions to similar problems. Jeremy is, no doubt, a man is the man of emerging trends. Jeremy is also a big specialist of change and also a shaper of the future. And he is finally a visionary. And as the dean of a business school, I can tell you that you're extremely popular with students and with the younger generations. Thank you very much for this journey with us tonight. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'm going to first ask all the photographers to put the cameras in the back. I'm used to it nice and quiet, and that means sit down and put the cameras in the back. Put your cell phones down, put your iPads down. All you have are pencils. GDP. GDP is slowing all over the world, everywhere. And the reason is productivity has been calming for two decades all over the world and everywhere. And the result is unemployment is high, especially for the young or any generation where we hear the word workforce. Now, economists say we can look forward to 20 more years of slow growth. And here's the reality. Out of two industrial revolutions in the last 200 years, half of the human race will be lifted up and will be much better in what we began this experiment, industrial way of life. The other half of the human race, they're making $2 a day. And here's the sad reality. The 62 wealthiest human beings in the world we could put them in this little section of the room, 62 people, the wealthiest people. Their combined wealth now equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human population on Earth. Three and a half billion people. This is just so dysfunctional that it takes my breath away. There's something really wrong with the way we're organizing our economic life. And now this economic crisis is compounded by a much more serious environmental crisis. Two industrial revolutions. We have spewed massive amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, methane, nitrous oxide, to make this industrial way of life. And now we are in real-time climate change. It's no longer at the door. It's in the house. And we are not grasping this. What's terrifying about climate change, and it's never described or explained, I think if we explain what climate change actually does, everyone in this room, every parent, every grandparent would be justifiably terrified about what's happening. Climate change changes the water cycles of the Earth. That is what this is all about. We are the watery planet. Our ecosystems have developed over millions of years based on the water cycles in the cloud covers that traverse this Earth. For every one degree 
that the temperature goes up on this planet from industrial induced global warming emissions for every one degree, that temperature goes up. The atmosphere of this planet is absorbing 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing that precipitation up into the clouds quicker. So we are getting more concentrated precipitation, more extreme water events, and more infrequent water. It's throwing off the water cycles of the Earth. We are experiencing blockbuster winter snows, massive spring flooding around the world, prolonged summer droughts on every continent, massive wildfires over those summer months, and category three, four, and five hurricanes. This is happening everywhere, and it's only 2016. And new reports just came out in the journal Science and Nature in the last few weeks, front page headlines, but nobody paid any attention to it. The new studies show that in Greenland and the Arctic, the water melt is much quicker than we thought, and now Antarctica is melting much quicker than we thought on a runaway exponential feedback loop and they're talking about storms in the next several decades beyond anything we've experienced since human beings have been on this earth. And within seven decades, we're going to see major coastal cities underwater, way before we thought this would happen. There are little babies now, your grandchildren, your children, who will be there. We are now in the sixth extinction event of life on earth, right now in real time. We've had five mass extinction events of life on this little planet over about 450 million years, well, well before humans were here. And every time, the chemistry of the planet shifted really very suddenly, massive quick die out. And each time, about 10 million years to recover new life. We're now in the sixth extinction event. This is being chronicled. This is not a model. And I want you to hear this if you're a parent, grandparent. Our scientists say that we could lose over half of all the species that live on this Earth by the end of the century. That's eight decades. As my wife says, we're not grasping the enormity of this moment. We may intellectually get it, but we're going on as business as usual. There's no guarantee. 99.5 percent of, of the species that have lived on this planet have come and gone. And we are the youngest species. We're the babies. Anatomically modern humans, here we are. We've been here about 200,000 years. So what do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world, and it has to be compelling. We need an economic game plan for that vision, and it has to be quickly deliverable everywhere in the developing and industrial world. We're going to have to be off a carbon-based civilization in less than four decades if we have any hope of beating this storm, because we're already in it. So we need to step back for a moment and ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions and the paradigm shifts occur in history? If we know how they occur, we'll get a roadmap here in France, in the business community, the civil society, and governance. We're going to get a roadmap and a compass that can launch us on a new journey, hopefully to replenish this planet in time so that we don't risk the worst part of the abyss, because we're already going to have real problems. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They share a common denominator, which is quite interesting anthropologically. At a given moment of time, there are periods when three defining technologies emerge and converge to create what we call, in engineering, a general purpose technology platform, an infrastructure that fundamentally changes the way we manage, power, and move economic activity across society. What are those three technologies? Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage our economic activity. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power our economic activity. And number three, new modes of mobility, transportation, and logistics to more efficiently move the economic activity. So when communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes and new modes of transportation, it actually fundamentally changes the way we manage power and move 
economic activity. It changes our spatial temporal relationships. It allows us to integrate into larger social units. Let me give you two examples. 19th century first industrial revolution, Britain. The Brits take us from manual print presses, pretty slow, steam power printing, really fast. This is a communication revolution. Cheap, abundant, quick print to manage economic life. Then the Brits lay out a telegraph system in the last part of that 19th century. Steam power printing and the telegraph, those communication technologies, converged in Britain with a new energy source that had not been used before, cheap coal, but in the British interlands. Then they invented the steam engine to harvest the coal to energy. And this is ingenious. Then they put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national railways, urban life, the Industrial Revolution. Communication, energy transport, manage power and move economic life. 20th century, second Industrial Revolution, the United States, centralized electricity, but especially the telephone. We think the Internet's a big deal. My gosh, the telephone was a big deal. Instant communication across the world at the speed of light. Later, radio and television. Those communication media in the U.S. converge with a new energy source, cheap Texas oil, powered by the Daimler internal combustion engine, but then Henry Ford put out cheap cars, buses, and trucks, and everybody got off on the road, transportation and logistics. Communication energy transport, manage power, move economic life. The second industrial revolution took us through the 20th century, and it peaked for the whole world in July 2008. If you remember that month, Brent crude oil hit a record of $147 a barrel on world markets. And when that happened, July 2008, the entire global economy completely shut down. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was an aftershock. You couldn't keep the fictional economy going when the real economy turned down. And the reason it turned down is that the entire civilization of the Second Industrial Revolution is based on fossil fuels. Fertilizers, pesticides, construction materials, most of our pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat, and light. It's all made out of the carbon deposits of a previous period of history. So when the price of Brent crude goes over 90 a barrel, all the other prices go up. When you get into the zone of 115 a barrel, purchasing power starts to shut down because products and services are prohibitive price-wise. So in 2009, oil went down to 50 a barrel because the whole economy had stopped. In 2010, we started re reinvent putting the inventories back together and regrowing the economy. But by 2014, we hit a new spike of 117 a barrel. Purchasing power shut down again. And the only reason that oil went down to 30 a barrel is now in the sunset of this great economic revolution, the energy companies are fighting each other. So OPEC keeps the spigot up and puts all that oil out on the market. Why? To destroy tar sands and shale gas. Because they're, they're not competitive under 55 a barrel. Now, what does it say about civilization when we're trying to get oil out of rocks and sand? What does that say? So what's happened is OPEC has destroyed shale gas, the so-called U.S. energy independence. It's gone. They're all going bankrupt right as we speak. Tar sands, gone. Pipeline, gone. And guess what? The oil prices are starting to go back up. This is a sunset. This is a convulsion of grow, shut down, grow, shut down. And now failed states, right where the oil is being produced and the volatility doesn't allow us to have a stable global market. Let me share an anecdote with you. When Chancellor Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first, first two couple of weeks of her new government to help her address the question of how to grow the German economy. So when I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the new chancellor, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy when your businesses are plugged into an infrastructure of centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, 
internal combustion road, rail, water, and air transport, and that infrastructure to manage power and move economic life peaked, peaked in its productivity 20 years ago at 18.5 percent aggregate efficiency, and nothing's changed on that platform. Aggregate efficiency is the ratio of potential to useful work in every conversion, and it's much of what productivity is about. The U.S. peaked in 1990 at 14 percent aggregate efficiency. Nothing's changed. Japan led the world and peaked in the 1990s in productivity at 20 percent aggregate efficiency. Nothing's changed. This platform, this infrastructure of the Second Industrial Revolution will not allow any country to go above 20 percent aggregate efficiency. Then they're stalled. That's why productivity has been declining for 20 years. So I said to the Chancellor, you can have market reforms, labor reforms, monetary reforms, fiscal reforms. You can incentivize a million Steve Jobs. It won't make a damn bit of difference. If your businesses are plugged into that infrastructure, we can't get any more productivity out of it. It's stalled. And on that first day, I introduced to the Chancellor a third industrial revolution that's emerging, a new convergence of communication, energy, and transport to manage power and move Germany. At the end of the day, the Chancellor said to me, we will have this third industrial revolution for Germany. And I'll report back what we've done there in the last 10 years. Germany is moving. The communication internet has matured to manage economic activity. We have 25 years since the World Wide Web. Everyone here tonight has a smartphone on them, I'm sure. Instant communication. Now that communication internet is converging with a digitalized renewable energy internet, which in turn is converging with a digitalized, automated GPS and soon driverless road, rail, water, and air internet to create three internets. Communication internet, renewable energy internet, transportation internet to manage, power, and move all our value chains, all digital. These three internets ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. We're putting sensors across all the value chains to monitor big data and real-time activity. So we have sensors in the agricultural fields, factories, warehouses, smart homes, smart vehicles, all sending big data. But where are they sending the data to? Not to the cloud and to space. They're sending it to the emerging communication, energy, and transport internet to manage power and move our value chains. By 2030, we'll have ubiquitous interconnectivity. And what we're essentially doing is creating an external brain. This is a distributed nervous system that mimics the human race. On the upside, this is a huge potential leap forward for humanity because now the human race with cheap smartphones can go up on this Internet of Things platform and began to engage each other directly for almost no cost and eliminate many of the middlemen and all those vertical organizations that kept us from each other. This is potentially the democratization of the entrepreneurial spirit. Everyone can engage everyone directly. On the other hand, as exciting as this prospect is, it immediately raises the chill Ubiquitous interconnectivity, everyone connected. What about network neutrality? How are we going to make sure that governments and corporations do not purloin this open Internet of Things for political purposes or for monopoly commercial gain? How do we assure privacy when everyone's interconnected? How do we guarantee data security when everyone's connected? How do we prevent cyber crime and cyber terrorism and the disruption of the system and the collapse of the system around the world. This is the dark net. And I'm saying that it's equally powerful to the bright vision. And in the book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, I spend endless chapters worrying about the dark side and how we build resilience into the system so that it does not get disrupted. But just for tonight, let's say that we can deal with this because I believe that the dark net will and join the political struggle of the next three generations. How do we make sure that we keep this safe? But assuming we can, here's the benefit. Everyone in this room has a value chain, whether you're a homeowner, a small business, a large company. 
And every day, you're extracting things from nature, or have someone else is for you doing it, and those resources that you need, they're being moved around, they're being shipped, they're being stored, they're being converted into goods and services, you're consuming them, and then they're being recycled back to the earth. What this means is that we have three billion people now on the internet, and with the internet of things, we're gonna have the whole human race on that internet of things within 20 years. China now has, listen to this, a $25 smartphone with more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon. Everyone's gonna be connected, even if you make $2 a day. So if you have a value chain, a small business, large business, cooperative, nonprofit family, you'll be able to go up, and it's already emerging, on this Internet of Things platform, which is now emerging, and have a transparent picture of the entire economic data flow of the world. Even big companies didn't have that. We used to say, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. The seller doesn't want the buyer to know what the seller knows. Now everybody knows what everyone knows. The economic data is flowing freely across a global internet. And the access to it is nearly free, just a service provider and smartphone. So if you're a small business or a large company or cooperative here in France, you can go up on that Internet of Things platform and cut your big data on your value chain out from the rest of the noise. Just cut your big data on all of your value chain out from the rest. Then you can mine your own big data with your own analytics. And with those analytics, you can create your own algorithms, your own apps. And this will allow you, on your value chain, to dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential to useful work, at every single conversion step on your value chain with software and feedback. So you can dramatically increase your productivity, dramatically reduce your ecological footprint. We're getting more out of less and dramatically reduce marginal cost. Some of the marginal costs are already going so low, they're heading to zero marginal cost, which is the title of the new book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society. And the digitalization process, which is now began with the communication internet and soon going to the energy and transport internet, has led to the birth of a new economic system called the sharing economy. Capitalism's given birth. We never saw it. We didn't expect it. This mature economic system's given birth to a little baby, a little progeny, the sharing economy. And this little sharing economy is flourishing alongside its capitalist parent. Now, the parent, capitalism, has to figure out how to relate to this child, uh, allow it to be nurtured, to find an identity, create a presence. But as you know, parent-child relationships are kind of sticky. Sometimes the parent wants the child to become a reflection of the parent and be absorbed into the parent. In this case, sometimes the child likes that, other children don't. We're beginning to see a struggle between capitalism and the sharing economy, sometimes a love affair, sometimes a struggle. But be clear, the sharing economy, I believe, is the first new economic system to enter on to the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the 19th century. Capitalism's not gonna disappear. It's gonna still be here. But it will no longer be the ultimate arbiter of economic life in 35 years from now. It's gonna have to share the stage with its grown-up child, the sharing economy. This is happening right now. There are millennials here all over France, all over the world, and part of the day, they are sellers, they are buyers, they are owners, they are workers. They're producing goods and services for profit margins in the market. That's not going away. But part of the day, the millennials are producing and sharing all sorts of goods with each other for free, beyond the market, in the sharing economy. Let's take a look at what digitalization of communication has done to disrupt the traditional industries to get an idea of what's coming after that. It's only been about 17 years since Napster created that file-sharing music service. 17 years. We now have 3 billion people on the Internet who are prosumers. They're still sellers and buyers, owners and workers. They're now prosumers and providers and users. And they're producing music for each other at zero marginal cost. So what does it cost to have a little device? You record your music. It's studio quality. costs you 25, 30, 50 bucks. And then whether you send that music to one person or a billion people on the web, cost is zero marginal cost. 
You're just paying for your service provider. We have young people producing and sharing their own videos from their cell phones at near zero marginal cost. They're producing and sharing their own news blogs, their own social media, their own free e-books. They're contributing to Wikipedia and constructing the knowledge of the world all together and for free. Seven million students are taking massive open online college courses at near zero marginal cost, and they're getting college credits. Whole industries have been disrupted in the last 17 years. The music industry has crumbled. Television has shrunk. Newspapers and magazines have gone out of business. The book publishing industry, my newest book was put out in the pirate days before we could publish in our languages. And they were ranking it before Amazon could get a hold of it. You can't beat the kids. There's too many out there. You can outlaw the technology, but that isn't going to happen. While some industries, many big industries, have fallen in 16 years, thousands of new enterprises, some profit, some nonprofit, have emerged. Not just the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Alibabas, but thousands of startups at various levels, profit and nonprofit, they're creating the platforms, they're creating the apps, they're creating the analytics and the data, and they're flourishing. We thought there'd be a firewall here, and while the zero marginal cost phenomenon would impact the virtual world of bits, we actually didn't think it would move over the firewall to the physical world of atoms. What I'm saying in the zero marginal cost society is that firewall is now broken. It's called the Internet of Things, things, digitalizing things. We now have, let's go back to Germany. What's happened in 10 years since that first conversation with the chancellor we now have millions of people in Germany and across Europe, some in America, who are producing their own solar and wind at near zero marginal cost. The fixed cost of solar and wind are following an exponential curve just like computers did. And that's what we've lost sight of. We haven't seen it. When I was a kid in the 1940s and early 50s, there were only a few computers, and they cost millions of dollars. And the chairman of IBM said we would need a total of seven computers for the world. Seven. That's all we're going to need. We did not anticipate the Intel computer chip. Moore's law. M Mr. Moore at Intel, we recognized that the engineers were able to double the capacity and half the cost on those chips every two years. That's an exponential curve. Now a smartphone for $25. Similar cur curve for solar and wind. For 20 years, you know what a solar watt cost to generate in 1978? One watt of solar? $78 for a watt, solar watt. You know what it is tonight? 50 cents. $78, 50 cents. In 18 months from now, it's going to be 35 cents. It's plunging. And now there are power and transmission companies in our group around the world. You know some of them, but I won't mention them. They are quietly, right now, buying long-term contracts for solar and wind, 20-year contracts, at four cents a kilowatt hour. That's below nuclear and fossil fuel. And the Berkeley labs, the federal government labs of the U.S. just announced they are generating solar and wind at 2.5 to 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour. And the big story that you're not being told is it's over. And what's going on in the boardrooms is what do we do with 20 trillion, 30 trillion, or Citigroup said 100 trillion in stranded assets, fossil fuel and nuclear. That's a bubble that's going to make the subprime look like the small time. Those are stranded assets. They can't compete. But what's interesting in Germany is once you pay for the fixed costs, which are plummeting, everyone's going to have this technology in 20 years. Every little hut, every village in the developing world, everyone's going to be producing their own electricity. Here's what's happening in Germany. 32% of the electricity in this powerful country is now solar and wind in the electricity grid, 10 years. It's going to be 40% solar and wind before 2020. It's going to be 100% solar and wind and renewables within 25 years. And guess what? The marginal cost of this energy after you pay the fixed cost, zero. The sun has not invoiced us. The wind has yet to send us a bill. It's free. It's abundant. It's ubiquitous. So imagine what happens when you plug your businesses into a third industrial revolution platform 
uh, the communication internet with the energy internet, and those businesses are using near zero marginal cost energy in every single conversion on their value chain. This is what Germany understands. Little Denmark's done it. It shows you can do it. Three million people can do it. Anyone can do it. This is power to the people. What's happened here is who's generating this electricity? We have four major power companies in Germany, EMBW, RWE, EON, and Vattenfall. We thought they were invincible. These giant, global, vertically integrated companies, powerhouses. What's happened to them in 10 years is what's happened to the music industry and television and newspapers and magazines and book publishing. Millions of small players, farmers, small businesses, neighborhood associations, they created electricity cooperatives. That's the form you're going to see it. They came together in cooperatives. They all went to the banks and got loans. The banks were happy to give the loans because they could see they would pay back with the energy they're generating. You couldn't lose on the loan. They're producing all the energy. This is power to the people. Literally, figuratively, it's a game changer. The big power companies are only producing 7% of the energy. They can't scale it. They can scale centralized energy, which requires a lot of capital and vertical integration. They can't scale these energies because the sun's everywhere. You have to collect it everywhere. The wind, you have to collect it everywhere. The geothermal heat, you collect it everywhere. Cooperatives, laterally scaled, not vertically integrated. Does this mean it's the end of the power companies? Not necessarily, but they have to change their business model. And that's what I want to be clear on. We introduced a new business model seven years ago. Um, in fact, the president, the chairman of E.ON, Mr. Tyson, they asked if I would debate him seven years ago in the Netherlands, a neutral country. We had a three-hour debate. And I said, get used to it. Now we have millions, pretty soon tens of millions and hundreds of millions. Everyone's going to be producing energy in these cooperatives where they live and work. And they're going to send it back to the grid or go off grid and use it or send it back. So what's the mission of the power companies? You're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning. It's not either or tomorrow. It's how do you segue from the old to the new over three decades. The smart businesses have to be in two portfolios at once, a sunset portfolio, old business model, a sunrise portfolio, a new business model. In the new business model, I said to Mr. Tyson, you will make money by selling less electricity. Mr. Tyson said, how do we make money by selling less electricity? I said, you will set up partnerships with thousands of enterprises, and you will help manage the energy internet and the big energy data that's flowing through those enterprises. And you will help those enterprises mine their analytics, create their algorithms and apps, so they can dramatically increase their aggregate efficiency on their value chains, increase their productivity, reduce their ecological footprint and marginal cost, and in return, all those thousands of enterprises will share their productivity back with the power company. It's called performance contracts. Eon did it last year. They took the business model that we laid out. They sold off their nuclear and fossil fuels. They're in energy management. And they're scrambling with other companies because lots of companies would like to manage the energy internet. ICT, consumer electronics, logistics. So there's going to be a scramble of partnerships to see who collaborates across industry lines. And let me say this is not just Germany. When uh, President Xi and Premier Li came into office in China. I got the shock of my life. I had never met them. President uh, uh, Li put out his official biography and said he had read, he was a fan and read my book, The Third Industrial Revolution. Who knew? I was totally shocked. And he instructed, he said in his biography, the central government, move on this. Because China lost the whole first industrial revolution, they were occupied by colonial powers. They lost most of the second industrial revolution, just got in in the last 15 years. They're determined not to lose the third. I've been doing formal visits there. I just got back for three years. I just got back a couple of days, a week ago. To show you how fast China moves, after my first formal business with the government leadership, 11 weeks later, the chairman of the state electricity grid, the biggest electricity grid in the world, announced $82 billion commitment over the next four years to digitalize the entire electricity grid of China so that millions of Chinese people could produce their own solar and wind, send it back to the grid. Watch Berlin and Brussels and watch Beijing. 
The U.S. is still scrambling with shale gas. I know that's hard to believe because you think the U.S. is always ahead of the game. They've already lost a decade. Except for California, Oregon, and Washington, you can peel them off, they're with us. The rest of the country is still in the old energies. How are they going to compete with zero marginal cost? The coming together of the communication internet with the energy internet gives birth to the automated GPS driverless transportation logistics internet, and here's the rub. Owning automobiles created and maintained the second industrial revolution. It was all about buying automobiles. Here's the problem. Our kids, the millennials, the grandchildren, they don't want to own automobiles. That's grandma and grandpa, two automobiles, sitting there at the office or home, not doing anything for 90% of the day. That's grandma and grandpa. The young people do not want to own automobiles. They want access to mobility in real time, not ownership in vehicles over time. And they're moving to car sharing. That's a sharing economy. And to show you how it works, my wife and I were in a restaurant about two years ago. We saw a young millennial couple on the street. He whips out his little smartphone. Boom, 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 boom. He goes up to the communication internet to a sharing car website. Immediately, that, that website shifts him to the transportation internet. GPS. GPS locates a driver, we we're timing it, 90 seconds away from the passenger, PayPal pays. Why would these kids ever want to own a car again? But for every car shared, 15 cars are being eliminated from production. Larry Burns was the former executive vice president of General Motors. Some of you remember him until five years ago, major player still. He's a professor at the University of Michigan. He just did a study of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he said, in this middle-sized city, even today at this early stages of the transportation internet, we can eliminate 80% of the vehicles right now with the car sharing we have in Ann Arbor. The other 20%, we can have better mobility and cheaper. Now extrapolate this study. We've got a billion cars, buses, and trucks on the road in the world choking us in traffic. And they are the number three cause of global warming emissions. Number one is buildings. But in Germany, we've retrofitted several million buildings and turned them into micro power plants with clean renewables already. Created lots of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs. The number one cause of global warming is buildings. Number three is transport. Does anyone here in this audience of 1,000 people know what the number two cause of human global warming emissions is? Cows. And when I wrote that book, Beyond Beef, in 1990, my colleague said, you are out of your mind. It's methane. 1.3 billion cows. If aliens came here, they'd think they were the dominant species. I love cows, but methane, nitrous oxide, CO2. It's beef production, beef consumption, animal husbandry. And it's hard to say this. Even Al Gore won't talk about it. And in France, withdrawals, totally. If we can't even change our diet and move slightly down the food chain, and we'd rather risk extinction because maybe that's far off and it's now in the house, what, how are we going to do this? Think about it the next time you have that beef. I'm really serious. Number three is transport. If Larry Burns is right, we're going to eliminate 80% of the vehicles in the next two generations with car sharing. The other 200 million vehicles are going to be electric, China's putting out 5 million electric cars in the next five-year plan alone. So the other 200 million that are left, those vehicles are going to be electric. They're going to be fuel cell. They're going to be operated by near zero marginal cost renewable energy. They're going to be 3D printed with recycled material. That's already happening. The Stratus, that Italian car, it's out. It's mostly printed. Beautiful design. The Italians know design. It's a beautiful car. And those vehicles are going to be driverless at zero marginal cost. And we're not just talking about automobiles that are coming out in the next few years. They're being tested. We're talking about ocean liners, all rail, water, ocean liners, and drones. China went to the Consumer Electronics Fair in Las Vegas a few months ago, and they had a drone. It picks you up. It delivers you. There's nobody there. Zero marginal cost in the labor. Does this mean this is the end of transportation companies? Not necessarily, but they have to be both in a second industrial revolution and a third industrial revolution mode. Several weeks ago, I joined Daimler. And Daimler's still going to sell millions and millions of trucks. This isn't tomorrow morning, but we're seeing long-term trends here. 
So Dimer asked me to lay out this narrative. They brought in 350 journalists, and this was amazing. After I did my talk, the chairman of Dimer Trucks got up. He's on the eight-person board of directors, and he said, well, guess what? Over the last several years, we have put sensors on 300,000 trucks. All over the trucks, sensors, 300,000 trucks. And so what they have now I call big data, mobile big data centers now across the roads. These are mobile big data centers collecting uh, information on weather conditions, traffic, warehouse deliveries, and everything you'd want to know across the logistics chain. And they've created a new business, a logistics business. They're now at the center of the emerging transportation digital internet. And that logistics business will allow them to mine the data and provide apps for your businesses, for homeowners, for anyone that needs a logistics chain for their mobility. And so when he was done talking, they went to a live video feed with a helicopter looking over their trucks on the German expressway, and they're waving to the driver in the truck, and he said to the drivers, take your hand off the wheel, take your feet off the pedal. It went to automatic, and the drivers became software people monitoring the screen. And the trucks platooned together, and they became a mobile data train, picking up data across the system. I would expect nothing less of Daimler. They came up with the internal combustion engine, which started the second industrial revolution. They're now right there in the third. So you have to be in both. They're still going to sell lots of vehicles, but we're moving toward managing that logistics network. That's what transport will do, along with ICT, consumer electronics, et cetera. We're moving into a sharing economy. And the best way to understand that, we're sharing the homes, we're sharing the vehicles, sharing the toys. This is really what got me. The commercial toy was invented in Ravensburg, Germany, this beautiful little medieval town. Anybody visited this town, Ravensburg, Germany? That's where commercial toys emerged. So traditionally, a parent brings home a toy to their three-year-old daughter and says, this little toy, what happens is they say, we bought this toy. Santa Claus didn't bring this. It's not Christmas. We bought this toy for you. This is your toy. It's not your brother's toy. It's not your sister's toy. It's your toy. It's your property. You need to take care of it. You need to be responsible for it. And that little three-year-old is saying, wow, what did I just hear? Not my brother's toy, not my sister's toy, my toy. Power, status, control, and negotiating power. You understand if you're a parent. Now, a new generation of millennial parents are going up on these toy websites where there are thousands of shared toys, and you just pay a subscription, then you're in. Then you can download, take home any toy you want, and within a few years, the drone will deliver it to you well before the end of the next 10 years. It's going to deliver that at near zero marginal cost. You bring the toy home, and this is happening now, and parents are saying to their little daughter, this toy, another little girl played with this toy and had a lot of fun with it. And she took good care of it because she knew one day you'd want to play with the toy. And you'll want to take good care of it because one day another little child will want to play with the toy. The child is learning the toy is not a possession to defend. It's not status. It's not influence. It's not power. It's access to an experience, and then you distribute it so someone else can enjoy it. The child is getting ready to move from ownership to access, from markets to networks, and from a, an economy that's closed to one that's open, and they're going to distribute things over and over again so nothing goes to the landfill. That's the change, and it happens family to family. Now, we're not going to get rid of property. The child will learn about property and markets. That's still going to happen, but they're going to have two options. Part of the day, they'll be in property and markets. Part of the day, they'll be sharing all sorts of things for nearly free in networks. It's a good option. Both choices make sense to me. How do we pay for this? When uh, President Juncker took over the European Commission, I wrote him a long memorandum on the new journey for Europe. We call this Digital Europe. We have a similar one that I did for the leadership of China. It's called Internet China. It's the same plan. And Mr. Juncker got back to me and he said, this is what we want, the next journey for Europe. Lay out this infrastructure across every region of Europe and our partnership regions. We have a billion-person market here. Europe, the Mediterranean, our partnership regions. If we can lay out this infrastructure and streamline this digital technology platform, think about the opportunity here to dramatically increase productivity reduce our ecological footprint and our marginal cost, have a flourishing capitalist market that's, that 
wins on volume, not price, but volume, and servicing the network and a sharing economy. Then the question is, how do we pay for this? And I said, well, you know, <laughs> the money is all there. All we have to do is ask where the money's going. In Brussels in 2012, which was a bad recession year, you know how much money we spent on infrastructure across Europe in 2012, public and private infrastructure? Take a guess. 700 billion, 741 billion US dollars equivalent on infrastructure in a bad year all over Europe. The problem's not the money, it's where it's going. We're spending new old, China's spending new old, America's spending new old. We're pouring all that money into a second industrial revolution infrastructure, centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion road, rail, water, and air transport, and we can't get more than 20% aggregate efficiency in any country on that platform. It's peak, the productivity. So I said, if we simply reprioritize our money, keep some of it in the second industrial revolution infrastructure, but put some of it in the third so regions can build out this new infrastructure, we're there really in four decades. The European Investment Bank has now reprioritized their priorities. So if you're a region now in 2017 and you want to get monies, here are the priorities. Digital communication, digital energy, digital transport, digital education for the workforce, and digital health care. We're beginning to move. Watch what happens beginning in January 2017 as regions across Europe do this. Right now, we're in three test regions. My global group is in the third year in northern industrial France, Haute de France. We're now doing the master plan for um, Rotterdam to The Hague, 25 cities. And we're now doing all of Luxembourg, the first member state. These are the test regions to lay out this infrastructure. But next year, every member state's going to have regions laying this out and connecting, like Wi-Fi. We're just beginning, just beginning. Every industry will be involved in this infrastructure build out in Europe and in China. And that means telecom, ICT, power and electricity, consumer electronics, construction and real estate, big, transportation, logistics, manufacturing, life sciences, they all have to build this infrastructure out. It's two generations. And this puts people back to work. Now, some of you remember I wrote a book uh, called The End of Work in 1995. You remember it came out here. Michelle Rocard wrote the forward. And that led to the 35-hour work week we did here. But in that book, I said, we're moving to automation. We're going to have automated factories, then automated white collar, then automated conceptual knowledge workers, and AI. So there's a new spate of books 20 years later. There's nothing new. This was already happening. We are moving to automated markets. But here's the big but. We have one last surge of mass wage labor over two generations. And that is we have to build out this infrastructure across the world. That means that millions of semi-skilled, skilled, skilled and professional workers are going to have to do this. Robots and AI will not build this smart infrastructure. We have to retrofit every building in France, make it efficient, put in the insulation. That's real labor intensivity. And then once you retrofit it, you make it efficient, then you put the micro power on. Then we have to manufacture and install renewable energy technology, solar, wind, geothermal. People have to do that. They have to install it. Robots aren't going to come to your house. AI is not going to install it. We have to take the entire electricity grid of France and transform it from servo mechanical and dumb to digitalized and smart and energy internet. We have to lay out the new underground cable. We have to have digital meters monitoring in every home office and factory. Who's going to put those in and manage service them? We have to take the transportation network of France, road, rail, water, and air, move it from dumb to smart. Who's going to put the sensors across the system? Who's going to install and manage thousands and thousands of charging stations and fuel cell stations? So we have an opportunity here in two generations for one last surge of mass employment. But once the system's in, it's called smart. It runs by analytics and big data and algorithms and small supervisory workforces. We have the most streamlined capitalist market in the world because the optimum market in classical economics is where you sell at marginal cost. And this marginal cost is going to be very low. You'll make it on the volume on the network and the long tail, not on the expensive products. And most industries will move from selling products 
to managing the services on these nets. Most companies will move from selling one-off products to actually keeping the products and then managing the services those products give you. For example, if you have a good product, a new building, you'll keep the product when you build it, and then you'll manage it and people will access it when they need it. You can take that across every industry. What we're going to see is what happened to IBM. IBM was in trouble in 1995. Their computer was their cash cow, but guess what? The Japanese and Koreans and everyone else had the same computer and it was cheaper. No margins left in the box. So Lou Gerstner said, well, we might be out of business. Nobody needs the box. That's just a box, the computer. So what do we have that people really need? And they decided they know how to manage information. And now everyone has a CIO and everybody's managing information. This is now going to happen across many industries where we're moving from selling the box to helping direct and manage the networks and service those networks in a globally connected world. Let me say in the end that the technology is there. We're lucky, but I got to say the technology isn't going to get us to where we need to go by itself. I'm not a technological utopian. I'm not a futurist. I'm not a determinist about technology. And I've had many technologies that I've been critical of, as you know, like GMOs. We started that confrontation in our office 20 years, 25 years ago. But what I'm saying is this technology can be scaled, but there's something else that needs to happen. We need a change in consciousness, and we need it quick. In one generation, it separates your grandparents and parents from your grandchildren. It's got to happen in one generation. And I'm guardedly hopeful, but I'm not naive. I don't know if we'll make it. I honestly don't know. I really think it's bad. But we've got a shot, and what I do know is the human race is the most social creature on Earth. And once we get it right, the story, we move very quickly. We electrified the whole world in less than 50 years, most of the world. That's amazing. So here are the three things I think are happening that give me some guarded hope. We're seeing a definitional change on three major categories, how young people view freedom, power, and community. The older generation in this room, we all view freedom in the British and Anglo-American Enlightenment idea, the French took it on too, that each person is an autonomous agent. Every baby seeks their autonomy. They seek their self-interest. They seek to be independent, not beholden, self-sufficient, and an island to themselves. And the more you can become an island to yourself, the more free you are. You're not dependent. So freedom in the old view is exclusivity. For a young millennial, that notion of freedom is death. For them, the ability to flourish, if freedom is the ability to flourish, it's directly relational to the amount of network communication they have. It's not ownership, it's access. And for them, autonomy is death. Every moment they seek to be connected, to be engaged, to share their talents with each other in global networks. They're in the biggest family apple in the history, the Facebook, and they're Skyping on global classrooms. So for them, freedom is not exclusivity, it's inclusivity. It's not being an island and autonomous, it's being engaged and connected in network after network after network. That's a completely different definition of freedom. That's a game changer. The older generation, we believe that power is a pyramid. And of course, it leads to the 1% and 99%. That's history. But for a younger generation that grew up on the internet, for them, power is not a pyramid. Power is lateral scaling networks, because millions of them come together on an even playing field. They share their talents, open source. They create their social capital. And for them, power is the network. And the networks are designed to be distributed open, collaborative, transparent, and laterally scaled. Power is networks, and those are laterally scaled. That's a whole different definition of power. Finally, I'll end with this. It's about community. I'm sure I'm the oldest person in the room tonight. I grew up in a geopolitical world. Most of all of you did. Post-Westphalia, the geopolitical world, every individual is a sovereign. We pursue our self-interest. We compete with other individuals for scarce resources in a zero-sum game world, correct? Our nation represents us and their sovereigns, and they compete with other nations who are sovereigns, 
and each one is competing in the marketplace and the battlefield for scarce resources in a geopolitical world. Zero-sum game, correct? Can anyone tell me tonight how we address climate change and survive on this planet in the next eight decades with that form of consciousness? What's happening is young people are coming home, and it's giving me some hope, with biosphere consciousness. Some of them, your, your children and grandchildren, they're coming home, teenagers, and they're saying, where the peace, you know what they're saying? They're saying to their dad, why are you using so much water while you're shaving, wasting the water? They're saying to their parents, why is the little red light on on the Philips TV? We haven't been in that room in five weeks, wasting electricity. Why do we have two cars? Why can't we car share one? And here's the one I'm fond of, and I'm sure this is even happening someplace in France. Young kids are coming home, and they say, where did this piece of steak come from? Where did this hamburger come from? They're asking that. Did it come from a rainforest? Did they have to destroy the trees for three inches of topsoil that only give you four years of grazing for the hamburger? And the kids understand if they destroy those trees for the soil to graze the hamburger, those trees have very, very unique plant and animal life that only exists there. They go extinct, part of the extinction record. And they know if the trees are no longer there, to have the soil to graze the cow for the hamburger, those trees aren't there anymore. They can't absorb CO2 from industrial emissions. And that means the temperature of the planet goes up. And that means some farmer can't feed her kids because she's getting spring floods, summer droughts, and wildfires. Really, it's because of that piece of beef. Those kids are learning ecological footprint. They're learning that every single thing we do in our waking hours and beyond intimately affects the well-being of some other human, some other species, the ecosystems we live in. This is not academic. They're learning to live in the biosphere. That's the 19 kilometers from the stratosphere to the ocean where life and the chemicals of the planet interact to maintain this experiment on Earth. I'm guardedly hopeful these children are moving from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness, and I'll leave you with this thought. It's guardedly hopeful. A couple of years ago, President Xi in China called for a one belt, one road from Shanghai to Rotterdam. At first, he thought it was just a train. But then there's been a whole lot of discussion between Brussels and Beijing and Berlin and Beijing and saying, wait a minute, we're doing digital Europe, you're doing internet China. Why don't we begin to work together? Why don't we begin to share our common space across Eurasia? It's the biggest landmass in the world. Why don't we create something different here and begin to think how we can lay out this digital infrastructure across Eurasia, and maybe all those failed states in between can come of age. It's only a vision now. If I would say, can this be done, I would say, well, pretty big struggle to make this happen. But at least it's new thinking because you can't control this. Because this distributed system means that anybody where they are locally can choose to stay on the system or go off. It can't be controlled by centralized power. This is a new type of space. This is the commons. This is the biosphere. This may be the hope for the next generation, but the struggle is enormous. Uh, the obstacles are there. And we still have people fighting tribal blood wars and religious wars and ideological wars while the kids are trying to hook up and connect as a single family in a biosphere. So when, here's my last hope for France. My bet. In northern industrial France, Haute de France, it used to be Picardy and um, in uh, Nord Pas Calais, we're in our third year, and this little region is the poster child for Europe. There are hundreds of projects. They're laying out this whole infrastructure. Go there and visit, and you will see something going on in this old industrial region you see nowhere else. There's no reason it can't be done everywhere. And, and I know, France, you have world-class businesses across the industries. You have the experience, the expertise, and my bet is that France is going to join Germany very, very quickly, and when those two come together, the business community, governance, the civil society. It's going to move Europe, and Europe's going to help with China move the world. And it's up to the business people in this room to be right at the front of the pack so that you can engage this, and when your grandchildren look back and say, what did you do? We made the first step in this journey to reheal the biosphere, to replenish the Earth, to allow future generations to have their moment, not just our species, but our fellow creatures. This is our single mission that everyone in this room should be on from here on in, in whatever business you're doing. If you're just doing business as usual, 
we're going to lose the game. If you can be on this journey and help others move on this journey, we may have an opportunity to transform our relationships to the planet we live in. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.